Good morning and welcome to the Great Lakes Carbon Utilization Maps webinar. We're pleased to have you with us this morning. And today we are going to briefly recap the results from a study that a fantastic team of students did last summer. And then Dick Greeley will walk you through the maps that we created that were a key driver and source of framing and data for the conclusions of the study. There we go. Okay. Just briefly, the Global CO2 Initiative focuses on carbon utilization. And we think about it in two ways. One, climate change asks that we dramatically reduce CO2 levels, both in current emissions and legacy emissions. And if we capture CO2 out of the ambient air or out of a smokestack, and we can use both the raw food gas or the purified compressed CO2 stream to make products. Going forward, um, CO2 is not usually used as an ingredient in precast concrete and aggregates, but it wants to flow into minerals, anything calcium and magnesium based. And so construction materials are a really exciting opportunity for us to sequester CO2 durably and permanently at a very, very large scale. We also, we'll need as a society going forward to replace the source of carbon in products such as fuels, chemicals, fertilizers, plastics, and captured CO2 also is a fantastic way for us to defossilize our economy and create a circular carbon economy with these products. This updated market study from also from last summer concluded that in 2050, we have the opportunity to utilize two to 27 gigatons of CO2 every year with a market opportunity of 1.1 to $4.4 trillion. For reference, the global economy is 85, I think $86 trillion right now. So we have a huge opportunity to for, reformulate the basis for our economy going forward with these products. Segwaying into the work that was done last summer that we'll hear about the maps uh, today, um, the Conference of Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers unites the um, governors and premiers of eight Midwestern states and the two Canadian provinces, all connected by the Great Lakes. They work as equal partners and their mission is to grow the region's $6 trillion economy and also protect the area's natural resources. And they approached the Global CO2 Initiative and asked us to come up with ways that they could help drive our area as a go-to area for the, for the budding carbon offset market. What we found, a team of fantastic five students, one of them, Morgan Cobb, is on our call today. Well, what the students found is that from 2022 to 2015, there is a total of 14 and a half to 52 gigatons of really high quality carbon storage available that can be sold into the carbon markets. This can not only balance the uh, regional emissions of 1.5 gigatons every year, there's lots of extra to sell into the voluntary carbon markets, both on the natural base solution side, uh, things like planting trees, and also on the engineered solution side. And we'll take a look at that in just a minute. So the, our region has an opportunity to lead the world in um, carbon offsets, uh, products, revenue, and employment, and, which is a very exciting conclusion. And I'm proud to say that the Great Lakes St. Lawrence governors and premiers are now working to help promote that agenda moving forward. The students came up with detailed recommendations and areas for further study, which uh, are underway as we speak. Here um, is what that revenue and gigaton detail looked like. The students in this case did not focus on the circular carbon. They only focused on the durable carbon storage. Um, 
And what we see is that reforestation uh, was broken down into two categories, public lands and private lands. And public lands are already very well managed. The students to come up with these conclusions used quantitative data, which Dick will be presenting today, as well as published reports, but they also talk to a lot of people. This field is moving so quickly that if you wanna know what's going on, you really need to talk to people in addition to looking at printed and published materials. And so on public lands, for example, they talk to the heads of forestry for um, three states. They talk to the Nature Conservancy. They, you know, they talk to people active in that space. And there's not a lot of, there's incremental opportunity on public lands to sequester CO2, but it's not, not huge. Um, the real uh, opportunity is on private lands. And so you can see there's, you know, we can store up to 2.2 gigatons a year there um, with significant revenue. There's a lot of challenges associated with that. You have to aggregate private landowners. Often they're rural. They may not necessarily um, be managing their lands for anything, much less for carbon, which is something you can't see. But there are some nonprofits and for-profit companies starting to move into this space and seeing some success. So hopefully with time, this can snowball and and make progress because we need to be planting trees. Um, for our study, we uh, assumed that the uh, annual planting potential as identified by the Nature Conservancy, you'll see those maps in a minute, um, are the minimum there is 10% of that potential and the max is 100%. On the engineered side, we looked at construction materials. They are used in large quantity uh, every year per capita globally. Um, and aggregates are the largest opportunity. When we say aggregates, we mean sand, we mean stone. Uh, the smaller the particle, the greater the opportunity for sequestering CO2. And we assumed for these calculations that 10% of the uh, incumbent market was uh, the minimum and 100% was the maximum. You can see there again, look, tremendous opportunity for uh, storing gigaton storage and uh, revenue potential. Uh, and then last but not least, we also looked at geologic storage in class six wells. What that means in United States terms is wells that are in saline aquifers or unmineable coal, other sedimentary formations that can accept liquefied CO2 underground, compressed liquefied CO2. And we use 10% of the NAT carb low estimate for the low estimate here and 10% of NAT carb high for the high estimate. Uh, Dick will show you those Department of Energy resources. Um, so with that, I am going to hand off to Dick, who will walk you through the maps. Thank you, Susan. Um, as Susan said, my name is Richard Greeley. I'm an Associate Director in Innovation Partnerships, part of the Office of Research here at the University of Michigan. My uh, usual role is to help the commercialization of UM research technologies so that they can make as big an impact as possible, whether that's from the point of view of research, societal, a greater societal impact or even e economic impact in terms of starting companies and so forth. Two of the uh, schools I support um, here at Michigan are the College of Engineering and the School of Architecture, both of which obviously have a, a, you know, potentially a lot to contribute in terms of reducing carbon. And as a result of that work, I got to know Susan and Volker Sick, who runs the Global CO2 Initiative, and I you know, try to help out. I, I work with a variety of, of carbon capture technologies as part of my portfolio. But uh, as part of, you know, working with Global CO2, I recently got a, a degree in GIS from Penn State a few years ago, and I look for projects where I could help out those skills. So when Susan reached out to me to help the, uh, the group producing this report, I was more than delighted to have a chance to help out. So what I want to accomplish in this webinar is a couple of things. First of all, you know, just, you know, show you what map layers we chose um, to put together this project, you know, and I will readily admit that, you know, this job was more one of helping working with the students to pick the right layers as opposed to, you know, having to create new layers from scratch. There's a, a number of tremendous resources out there today. 
uh, from the Department of Energy, National Renewable Energy Lab, Nature, Nature Conservancy, and so forth. Um, but while the, these map layers are important, I think the thing that, you know, as you'll see, what I was trying to, one of the things I want to accomplish is how do we bring this information out to help people who, you know, aren't already experts to understand it better? So the idea is um, trying out new ways of presenting information, bringing in information into the maps. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of that. And that's actually one of the biggest things I'm interested in hearing from the audience is, you know, what other ideas you have in terms of how do we make this, you know, as impactful as possible. So uh, the uh, very briefly, I just want to give you a quick overview of the uh, map layers that we chose. Um, the uh, basically they could be divided into a bunch of you know five general areas. One is the uh, sort of current projects and and the part the reason for showing that certainly was to emphasize to our client, which was you know the Great Lakes, you know states and premieres. Uh, uh, I'll botch the name, <laughs> Susan. You'll remind me of the, the right name. The, basically, the Great Lakes and and provinces that are you know that we were attending this study for, but to make the point of you know what's you know what projects are underway already. Um, another is you know, and this was more illuminating to me is where are the CO two point sources today. Um, you know, not having you know looked at this data before, I was pretty amazed by the the, uh, the number of large CO2 point sources around. But as part of, you know, as part of, you know, promoting solutions, we had to think of both, how do we move this? How do we move this around to different places? Do we just use trucks, which would then, you know, put more potentially, uh, you know, put more CO2 into the atmosphere? Are there distribution lines that we can naturally take advantage of, whether it's crude oil or gas and so forth? There are, as Susan mentioned, you know, this, 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 uh, project was looking a lot at underground sequestration. So whether it's unmineable coal, sedimentary, and then lastly, you'll see several examples of information we were able to find for biological sequestration. So with that, let me uh, let me just briefly, actually one more thing to mention before we get, you know, start showing you some of the, uh, the maps. The, uh, one of the things that um, for this work I was using just for the map people in the audience, I was using ArcGIS Pro and uh, ArcGIS Online from Esri. And the reason for that is not only familiar, familiarity with the tools, but they have some tremendous capabilities um, to allow you to, to create these dashboards and story maps, which I'll be showing you later on. Um, what I'd like to do first is just briefly show you some of the, you know, some of, just do a quick, you know, run through of some of the data that was available that we used. You can see here, all these points indicate projects that, you know, are underway, um, you know, in the in the Great Lakes area. I will say that overall, we were able to find more data from um, in the US. We're still looking to try to, you know, fill out, you know, that in some cases, the data from Canada, but, you know, we were, we I think directionally, we were providing the right information. So we didn't want to let perfection get in the way of, um, you know, getting something useful. The, uh, as you can see here, when you, you know, look, you can zoom in, you can zoom out. When you, when you click on any of these projects, there's more information available. Here's an example of a company, Energy Energy Inc. This was a project that was, you know, in this case terminated. It was a capture and storage project. There are other projects going on here. For example, here's one going on at SUNY in New York. And you can see there's a variety of different ones. The, uh, the, the black were pre and post combustion point sources. Um, and I'll show you in a second where, where all this data came from, because I was, again, you know, this is part of the, uh, the building into the dashboard. You know, you could see here, here's, you know, some work going on at, you know, uh, University of Illinois and Champaign. There's other projects going on um, you know, down here, you know, it's different centers that are active in this, in this space. The, uh, some of the, this chart is one that never fails to amaze me. This was mentioned briefly earlier. This is the, uh, this shows all the different point sources and it, it's, it's, it's still filling in, but there we go. 
all these the the larger CO two point sources, you know, which came which basically reinforced to me why a why this is such an important you know area that we need to work on, but it's also an interesting uh, you know geographic problem in that how do we from all these different places how do we get how do we capture this how do we move it to places where we can do the right things with it the uh, as is. As uh, Susan mentioned, there's a number of places where um, there is, you know, there are brine samples being gathered. Let me get rid of some of the other uh, information here, where brine sources are being gathered to to understand the capabilities of what could be done. There are a number of pipelines that, you know, that we looked at in terms of how could we, you know, again, this is to reinforce the overall point to our audience that. In many cases, there may be pipelines that we could take advantage of because these 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 fuels, you know, the the CO two that we're collecting could be converted into other chemicals, which is a op potential opportunity for the people who both move fuels, you know, and uh, chemicals around. So here's the here's the crude oil pipeline in the U.S. Here's the hydrocarbons. Here is the uh, petroleum products, and then probably most extensive here is the uh, the natural gas pipelines that are available. And again, you know, there's information by clicking on them. You can, in this case, I, I trimmed down the amount of information, but there was, um, um, you know, this is basically the operators, operator's northern border. And, you know, you, you can start to get an idea of, wow, who's running this? What's available? How extensive is it? Is it? Oh, here we go. <laughs> My apologies, I have a very sensitive mouse that I <laughs> will probably continue to fight with during this presentation. The, um, the um, as Susan mentioned, one of the things that was being looked at deeply in this report is unminable coal. So in terms of, you know, where could we put this if, if, if the CO2 is captured? There's, um, Another area that we looked at was again the reforestation opportunity. Now it's interesting from a from a U.S. perspective, the uh, the the capability for reforestation is while higher in the east and the northeast, as you can see here, is literally this is a county by county accounting of what the opportunities are. The uh, it still doesn't represent. You know, when you look at the overall capability, it still doesn't represent, you know, potentially the biggest bang for the buck. We also were able to get information about um, the, uh, you know, biomass waste by county, and you can see, you know, what the the potential opportunities there might be. And again, you can you can zoom in on any one of these counties, and you can find out, you know, how much is there. And again, this is information that's readily available. And we were just trying to use it to, to reinforce these main points. The uh, lastly, in, in terms of showing you some of the different layers, here's the, uh, I'll get rid of this. Here's the, uh, and well, it's going to be coming up in a minute, I hope. <laughs> um, the North American sedimentary basins. Um, it's probably just being a little, a little slow today. That's okay. Anyway, the point is, you know, we were trying to pull off map layers that, you know, again, reinforced our point, had good detail and would help educate the, the, the help educate our audience. Now, as I said before, one of the one of the aspects of, you know, pulling together all these layers is we're trying to tell a story. And um, if you're already well versed in it, you know, the, 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 the map layers can and the map can be a very useful tool. But we we're trying to think of the people that were. Um, you know, other people that may be consuming this report. So at a, at a higher level, one of the things that we wanted to try out and take advantage of is something called dashboards. This is something that is available within the Esri suite it's through ArcGIS Online. It utilizes the same maps, but you're able to provide a great deal of extra information about, about the, uh, you know, what you're seeing and I should say that this capability, for example, was used by Johns Hopkins for their um, COVID dashboard, which was visited by millions of people a day. 
um, back at the height of COVID, and it was tracking literally, you know, on a daily basis where COVID was by city, by county, by country, all across the world. So you see here, um, one of the things, uh, let me just take you through this dashboard. And again, this is something that's easy to, to modify. So one of the areas that I'm interested in is what other pieces of data would people like to see, you know, to make this even better? One of the capabilities, you can see that the, the map screen nominally looks a little small. You can expand it into, you know, back into full size, and it has all the all the different, you know, legends. It has all the different layers that we talked about before. For example, the, uh, the CO2 stationary sources and so forth. So you can expand it and bring in the layers like you would in a regular map, but at the same time, you can add all this other information and, and present it for easier access. So for example, here's on the bottom left, here's a, a link to the main report that was provided. You just go right there. Similarly, you can, um, here's the description and links off to all the different um, map layers and source of layers. The uh, one of the other exciting things that um, you know that I find about these dashboards is you can start to give you know a little bit more. You can provide these information about the components in the map. So, for example, we just pull off from these different um, you know from the data in the map. We can get counts of the projects. We can, in this case. One of the things we did, you know, using that CO2 source layer, we're able to provide graphs, which was, again gives a little bit more context to the uh, to you know telling the story about the uh, about um, you know you know what's going on and and what should be done. The uh, another element that is available in the uh, is you can have multiple, not just have one map, you can have multiple maps teed up for quicker access. So for example, there's the stationary sources, there's the transport. We can have different, different maps that weren't in other places. So for example, Susan mentioned about the crushed stone and the potential for concrete. So this, is, this map represents the, uh, I'll zoom in a little bit here. Actually, you know, I'll just expand this. So, um, so this is the this is the opportunity for concrete for crushed stone and concrete, which Susan mentioned. So you click on a state, we can get you know both the high and low potential, both for crushed stone and in this case precast uh, concrete with sequestering via CO two, which is one of the, actually one of the technologies that I'm working on here at the University of Michigan. So the point is is that there's this capability with dashboards and could be made even more robust. Again, that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in people's feedback is that what are the other things, you know, that would be could be made available might be tracked on a regular basis that would tell the story even better. So that's dashboards. And now the sort of the next piece that I wanted to look at to um, try to extend the, uh, you know, extend the um, you know, the ability to quickly grasp what's going on was, and, and actually use it in a different sense, was something called storyboards. So a storyboard is something, again, this is a capability within the ArcGIS online suite, where it's, you can mix not just maps, but you can mix in audio, you can mix in video, and it's more of a report format as opposed to a tool format. You know, whereas the, the original map that I showed is more of a tool and the, the dashboard in a sense is a tool as well, although it more fully featured, the, the, the paradigm of the story map is different in that it's basically, it's like I said, it's a report format where you embedding, you can embed pictures, you can embed audio, you can embed video, you can embed maps, which again have this the same capability, and just reuse those same maps. You know, and so what I did in this case is I um, 
took those same maps that I produced for the dashboard and, and for just the regular layering and use them to tell the story about, you know, where is it produced, where, where might we put it, where, how can we move it around, but also embed elements from the final report, which, you know, Susan was showing to say, well, okay, how was this study done? You know, so the, the point is, is that um, this could be something that could be made read, readily available on the web because it's just a, uh, you know, you, you just open it up and, you know, everybody can have access to it and play with it. So, you know, here's, here's the information about, the, you know, some of the different options that were made available that Susan talked about. How, do the, how does this fit? What are carbon, what are the types of carbon offsets? What are the projects? And so forth. So the point is, is that, again, this could help tell the story about, you know, what, what goes on and, and, you know, what can we do? Where are the right places to do it? And so forth. The, uh, again, these are the, these are the uh, recommendations that came from the report. Again, you, this is, you know, repurposing and combining information and, um, you can also, again, you know, create links off to getting the final report. So with that, let me pause for a second and see if there are questions. It sounds like there's chat going on. So let me, uh, let's take a look at the chat and see what questions people might have. And, uh, and uh, um, you know, the, uh, and any, you know, ideas and suggestions, because to my mind, this is still very much a work in progress. I don't view this as, you know, a final product, but I view this as, you know, useful for our, for our initial purpose, but it's also something that can involve and be improved. So with that, let me, uh, let me open it up um, to anybody's questions or comments. And Dick, this is Susan weighing in. Um, I was monitoring the chat and the questions coming in. Some of them have been addressed already. Um, people were asking uh, for links to the study, links to the map. So those have been posted on the chat as well as uh, emails for yourself, myself, also our student Morgan Cobb. Um, we will introduce her here uh, once we're done with Q&A, but Yes, are there any other questions? So one question that was asked was the uh, level of student that was involved. This was a team of uh, three undergraduate students and one graduate student doing the work. And uh, Morgan Cobb, the lead for the study, is on the call today, and maybe we'll give a minute for other questions to come in. I can introduce Morgan if she can come off video. The recommendations that came from the study included submitting primacy applications for any of the states that do not have them right now. Um, the agencies uh, should coordinate with industry, especially hard to abate sectors, iron, steel, cement, but all industry. Um, they should hold 45Q tax, seminar, uh, tax seminars. Uh, a lot of companies don't understand that yet, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, explore cap and trade setup. Um, it was clear, you know, you, with the work that Dick did here with visualizing, it was so clear to the students that the region should work together. And they were able to convey that message to the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence governors and premiers. You know, don't think about doing class six wells in Wisconsin, but there's lots of opportunity there to plant trees. So the uh, it was clear that the region would really benefit from working together. And one of the, recommendations also included possibly doing a, cap, a regional cap and trade system similar to Quebec's um, or Reggie, and then a sovereign wealth fund was also suggested. All right, looks like there's some new messages coming in. Dick, hand off to you. Uh, let's see. Okay. 
Have you had people from the government or the private sector reaching out to you for more information? If yes, what was the information that they were looking for? Um, I haven't had that. Um, Morgan and Susan, I'll, I'll hand that off to you. Um, to uh, you know, in terms of in terms of specific interest. Yeah, so we um, met with some people from the Canadian government. So they attended our last webinar. And um, we were able to share with them kind of all of the mapping resources we did, and they were really interested in partnering with us um, on kind of expanding the maps because they had been working on a lot of the similar information. Um, we also received a lot of attention from the steel industry um, during our last webinar. Um, I think they were just very interested generally. Um, we didn't receive um, any like personal contact after that though, so. Um, yeah, but we were really excited to collaborate with the Canadian um, government, so. And we, we do get requests for the report. What, what On the corporate side, what we're seeing is that companies are using this to inform their own thinking as they consider what their emissions balancing strategies are and what their carbon offset opportunities are. The, the report is very, very extensive and it explains in great detail what makes a quality carbon offset, how do you get it? Um, there is some information on pricing. Even at, at the time of last summer, pricing, this field is just so new um, and pricing was really variable and there's just so much confusion still in these markets. It's gonna take them time to settle down. Um, but we're finding that companies are using this information for their planning, whether they be on the supply side or the demand side. And there were some follow-up areas of study that the students recommended as well, quite a number of them actually, and we won't go through all those, but one of them, um, was to consider how can you move CO2 from water? You know, this is the Great Lakes region. And Morgan, maybe you can just say a little bit about, so a new team of students is working on that and Morgan is leading that study. Maybe you could just tee that up and describe what that is. Yeah, absolutely. So um, like Susan mentioned, one of our biggest questions after investigating um, all of the different removal methods this past summer was whether or not the Great Lakes themselves could be used for carbon removal. Um, so something that is, um, and this is of interest because um, theoretically it's more energetically favorable and it is um, more, energ more energetically favorable than direct air capture uh, for removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, so if you remove CO2 from water, um, currently CO2 removal from seawater is widely studied. Um, but you can actually, uh, it causes an imbalance with uh, the CO2. So it'll cause atmospheric CO2 to diffuse into the water to replenish the CO2 that is removed. So it results in the indirect removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. And um, this is especially beneficial because it's more energetically favorable because the concentration of CO2 in water is um, a lot higher than it is in the atmosphere. So um, kind of going off of a lot of the different methods that have been uh, proposed for CO2 removal in the oceans, we decided to um, kind of see if those same methods could be used in freshwater systems, um, since that's not something that is widely studied. Um, and what we ended up uh, focusing on was different areas that could be implemented in the near term for um, impact. And so we looked at a lot of um, infrastructure that we could build off of, such as wastewater treatment plants or drinking water treatment plants. And currently um, we are proposing uh, pilot scale demonstration projects for both uh, biochar from invasive species from wetlands, as well as um, carbon removal from wastewater treatment plants. So we're really excited to be able to use waste streams in both of these areas, as well as build off of existing infrastructure to hopefully maximize um, and quicken the time to impact, so. Thanks very much, Morgan. Other follow-up work will involve updating the conclusions of the study itself. Um, although we did do an informal peer review, if you will, with all the experts we talked to, uh, which were numerous, by the way, we talked to over 60 people, in addition to the work that Dick did and looking at all the peer-reviewed studies that were available to come up with these conclusions. But 
um, some key insight came in after we after we hit send on, on the report. And that was that it would be really useful to split out the market value according to the source of carbon dioxide. It makes so much sense. So, you know, if it's direct air CO2 going into a mineral, uh, for example, or into concrete, that has more value if it's direct air capture CO2 as a carbon removal than if the source of the CO2 comes from a smokestack, which is an emissions reduction. And so we will do a brief update to the study and also give an update on the work that Morgan just described uh, in another few months. So we'll look forward to that. And I'm not seeing any more questions, Dick? Uh, somebody had their hand up at okay. one point. I think All it flashed right. by my screen. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone pop up. So well, look, I just want to mention something for the people that are still on, and that is, um, as I mentioned, you know, there's there's a lot of things that can be added to this to make it more consumable. Um, in addition, you you heard from Susan talk about a number of new air and Morgan, I should say, I didn't mean to exclude Morgan, um, about new studies, new information. Um, you know, that could be uh, can be at there be adding to the report, and therefore, you know, in terms of visualizing it and making it easier for people to understand. We have the capability to add, you know, to these these kinds of dashboards or story maps. So, um, it, you know, as you, we'll certainly be updating, you know, what we've put together. I think, you know, certainly one ask, you know, some, even even though I've, I've been intimately involved with this, you know, every time I hear uh, Susan talk about, you know, what's been done and and what's happening, it gives me new ideas of things we might do to expand what we're doing. So um, if you do have any ideas, questions, you know, feel free to shoot them to me because we're always trying to make this better and more, more useful because I think, you know, one of the challenges we're going to have in the future is not as much, um, well, it, I, I think the big challenge is we have to be as efficient as possible in designing and implementing solutions that, and that involves sharing information, getting people to the, to the same point of understanding. And that's where, you know, this kind of work, you know, comes into play. So I just wanted to, to you know, if, if you have your ideas, send them along. We're glad to, uh, to look at them. And thank you so much, Dick, for walking us through those nuts and bolts. We didn't do that in the summer because it really needed a good, you know, 20 minutes to walk through this fantastic backbone of the study. If you, um, again, as Dick's saying, if you have suggestions or questions for this, or if you just have questions about building these kinds of map resources generally, feel free to reach out to yeah, Dick really cool. directly. Um, I put his email in the chat. If you have questions about the water study, feel free to reach out to Morgan. And if you have general questions, feel free to reach out to me. And so we're ending four minutes early. We intended to go till 1045. Thank you very much for being with us today. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day.